Stephen Lynn Evans Ministries, preaching, teaching, healing, because Jesus is Lord. Hello everyone and welcome again to Steps of Faith. We're going to look today at Ephesians again. We looked at Ephesians last week and uh, Ephesians 1 was showing us the vital importance of election and predestination. Something that the church has often overlooked. Something that the church say, oh, I, I, I don't want to be part of that Calvinism. That's Calvinism, isn't it? No, it's not Calvinism, it's the Bible. Ephesians 1, and it's right throughout the New Testament. I could quote hundreds of scriptures. It's complete, it's a pillar of the faith. And people have been robbed of a pillar of the faith because they got into silly, oh, silly cliche little responses. Oh, predestination, oh, that's kind of, oh, I don't want to believe that. Oh, dear me. Read your Bibles, study your Bibles, my friends. We're going into the Word of God again today. We're building on what we looked at last time. And if you, if you didn't listen last time, I'll just say it like this, very easy. Ephesians 1, it talks about God, His will his electing of his people and predestination. And as we continue, we're going to verse 15 here and Paul's prayer of Ephesians chapter 1. Come with me now as we take a great journey. We're going on a great journey, my friends, into the Word of God, the Holy Bible. Verse 15, Therefore I also, after hearing of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, did not cease giving thanks for you, mentioning you in my prayers, so that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So there's wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance among the saints so that we walk in that knowledge so we don't walk poor and impoverished downtrodden downbeat dejected defeated we walk with faith and victory and power that's the call of God for us who are believers to walk in that strength my friends that's the reality of this. It's not theory. The Word of God isn't theory, it's reality when we embrace it and it becomes living inside of us. And it must become living and real inside of us, otherwise we'd be frauds. We'd be fakes. And we're not frauds and fakes. We're the children of Almighty God. We must embrace then what the Word teaches. Come with me. Let's continue here. It says, verse 19, And what is the surpassing greatness of His power towards us who believe? And what is the surpassing greatness of His power towards us who believe? according to the working of his mighty power, which he performed in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things in subjection after, under his feet. And he made him head over all things for the church, which is his body, 
the fullness of him who fills all things in all ways. We could spend a lifetime just going into those verses, phenomenal verses. But here's what I want to say. It talks about verse 21, far above all principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. That can be a, a name of a sickness, a disease, a situation a poverty, whatever it might be, his name is above all of those things. And we are in him, seated. And so if we are seated with him, by faith we can receive that power which is above all of those things. And that's the invite of Almighty God to all those who will study, and receive a revelation of their righteousness. You see, when we have a revelation of our righteousness, we start then to walk in the fullness of these truths. This is the most beautiful and precious thing, brothers and sisters, the reality of righteousness, a revelation of righteousness. And it says in verse 18 that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened, that they'd understand, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance among the saints. The hope of his calling is what? Well, the hope is an eternal thing, but the hope of his calling is for here and now. He's called us to not just survive, but to occupy and thrive on planet Earth, that's according to the riches of his inheritance. It starts right now. When you accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, it started. And so now we're in a position to reign and rule in this world. He's called us to do that. Now, let me share with you one of the issues here. This speaks of this reign and this rule taking place, but there is a deception in the church. Now, please open your ears, engage your minds, listen to what I'm saying. The deception in the church is seen in a, a, a movement that's called dispensationalism. Dispensationalism talks about the seven times of uh, the uh, world. The, it, the seven dispensations in world history. And on the surface, it makes sense, you know, to a sort of a naive understanding. You know, you'd think, oh, well, yeah, you can divide world history up into those seven things, I suppose. But the truth is, they're not biblical. It's not taught in the Bible. And it was taught by a, a man who was known for his heresies called J.N. Darby. And J.N. Darby's dispensationalism, which really came about in the early 1800s, was then promoted by a man called Silas Schofield in the Schofield Reference Bible, which was published in the early 1900s and promoted vigorously around America. And dispensationalism teaches that the Jews still have their old covenant Everything's in place with that. And it teaches that we are now in the church age. But the church age will end, and then there'll be this thousand years, and that's when the, sec the, the Jewish covenant then will kick in again, after the church age. And um, it's just a nonsense invention. But here's the surprise. Loads of people believe it. They may not explicitly believe it, but they've been taught it. And they think that Jesus is coming for a thousand years at some future point. Guess what? He's not. Jesus isn't coming for a thousand years in the future. That's Mickey Mouse stuff. That's, that's Disneyland. That's not the Bible. When it talks about the millennium, a thousand year reign, it's talking not literally a thousand years. It's not literal. Can't take that, those, everything in the Bible literally. You've got to have understanding and engage with it and understand how a Jewish mindset thinks. 
I mean, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the Bible says. Is it a thousand hills? What about a thousand and one? It's not a thousand. It's just a big number. It conveys a big number, you know. Um, seven times seventy. Is that how many times you're meant to forgive the sins of someone? Is it an exact thing? No, it's, it's showing a big number. So we have to understand, have intelligence, engage in wisdom with the Bible. Otherwise, we'll, we'll be talking about these silly doctrines and believing silly doctrines. Here's the danger of a silly doctrine. The silly doctrine says that in that thousand years, oh, well, you know, that'll be great for believers then. You know, Christ will reign and we'll be with him and we'll reign then and that, that'll be good. My friends, no. Jesus Christ came and he came and he introduced the kingdom of God on earth when he came. And the thousand years, the millennial reign of Christ has started through his church because we're the body of Christ on the earth. It's not in some thousand years in the future. It's now. It's for now. We are the body of Christ on earth now. And it's made very clear in the New Testament that we're meant to reign and rule with Christ. I mean, that's not some future thing. That's for now. And the church and many people have been robbed of this reality. You see, if you believe in this thousand years in the future, you don't put a demand on your faith for now. Very often that's the case. People say, oh, well, it'll be okay. No, now we're meant to reign and rule. Come with me, uh, please. Let's go to uh, Romans 5 here. Romans 5, and I'm going to read uh, to you from verse 17. It says this, for if by one man's trespass death reigned through him, then how much more will those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one Jesus Christ? Well, that's believers. We've received an abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness and we're called to reign in life now, not at some future point, a thousand years, you know, on all of that. No, now. And that dangerous, deceptive heresy of dispensationalism has gone throughout the church. And what it's done is it's caused people, it's caused believers to, to basically switch off a lot of the time and not put a demand on themselves and their faith for now. But my friends, I don't want that to be the case for you or I. I want us to engage and be all that he's uh, called us to be and do all that he's called us to do. We're gonna take a little break and we'll be back as we look further now into Ephesians. Hello everyone. I want to introduce this book to you, available at Amazon and other places, Word of Faith, Exposing the Critics' Mythology. It's a book that I wrote because I wanted to defend the Word of Faith movement and the people that I had so enjoyed and been blessed by. Buy this book and enjoy it. Welcome back, everyone. I'm so looking, looking forward to sharing some more from Ephesians with you. We've been looking at this and seeing how wonderful this is for us and how it applies to today. And I've been uh, explaining about this uh, heresy of dispensationalism because I don't want anyone to be robbed or trapped by it. And by the way, it's a very wicked thing uh, against uh, the Jewish nation, for example. A lot of the people who believe in dispensationalism think that they're for the Jewish nation, you know, because their covenant is still intact and it's, and it's you know, going to be uh, applicable in the future at some point. My friends, that is a wicked heresy uh, because what it does is it denies the Jewish, it separates the Jewish nation. It says, oh, you, you, you're not part of what we have here. Well, if we have the best in the new covenant, and we say, you're not part of it. You've got to wait for your old to come back in the future. That's a wicked and deceptive thing. No, my friends, the church was started as a Jewish church. The church began its life as a Jewish church. 
and it continues today with those Jewish influences fully in the center of it. But it's the new covenant and it includes peoples from all over the earth, all part of one body now, one united body, whether you're Jew or whether you're not, you're part of this one beautiful, magnificent body, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, no less, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ on planet earth. And we must never allow that deception that alienates certain people from the body. No, my friends, we must embrace the body of all believers from all peoples all over the world. We give God the praise for it. Amen. And don't ever allow anyone to dupe you with their nonsense. Um, no, uh, we are the Israel of God. The New Testament is so clear. I haven't got time to go into it, but uh, this deception was trying to creep in from the early days and trying to separate uh, Jews uh, from the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, the Apostle Paul addressed it in Galatians. He was very clear and he said, let a curse come on those who are doing this. He said it twice, in fact, if, uh, in Galatians chapter 1. But come with me now. We're going uh, into chapter 2 of Ephesians and uh, we're going to continue this understanding. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the age of this world and according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Among them we all also once lived in the lust of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Notice it says, even when we were dead in our sins he made us alive together with Christ not that we came to faith and he saw that we were due to come to faith from the beginning of time and he could see that we would uh, turn and he could see that we were no he brought us even when we were dead in our sins alive together with Christ by his grace, by grace we've been saved. And it goes on to say, and he raised us up and seated us together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Notice it's not of yourselves. It's not of yourselves. It's not anything that you've done, anything that you uh, uh, attained by your efforts, by your decision of your will, by you know your calculations, by your cleverness or anything else. No, no, for by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one should boast. There's no room for boasting in this. There's room for dependency on God and reverence and awe and worship to God for what he's done. What a wonderful saviour we have. It says in verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. God prepared those good works beforehand that we should walk in them. He did it. It's all him. It's all about him. And the beauty of 
embracing this position, my friends, is that when you recognize that it's all him, you no longer have any claim to greatness for yourself. How clever you were to choose God. How wise you were to see the truth. How you did this or you did that. No, it's all him. It's all about him. Everything about him. Jesus on the cross, all him. Jesus being raised from the grave, all about him. That life that we now have, all about him. And if you think about it, that's compatible with the natural way of things. The air that we breathe, the food that we eat, all about him. The blood that courses around our bodies, it's all him. All him. And when people understand this and take this on board, what happens is their devotion to God grows. And so they just have an abandonment to God and say, Father, we thank you, we praise you, we recognize it's all about you. It's not about me. It's all you. It's your, it's your work. It's your will. It's your life now I have. And that does a tremendous thing for a person because they're no longer resting on themselves. They're resting on God, his eternal truth. It makes such a difference. The whole emphasis of their faith changes when they embrace these scriptures that were his workmanship. Can you see it, my friends? I hope you can. Therefore, verse 11, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called the uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision in the flesh by human hands, were at that time apart from Christ, alienated from the citizenship of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So it's so clear. We were alienated from the citizenship of Israel in the past, but now we are the Israel of God. We're no longer alienated. And the Israel of the Bible isn't a geographical Israel. The Israel of the Bible is now in the New Testament. It pertains to all believers, Jew, Gentile, whatever you are. If you're a believer, you're in the Israel of God. And so this is so important for us to understand. And once again, that heresy of dispensationalism, which has affected so much of the church world, and this is why there's an exaggerated support at times for the physical uh, Israel. Uh, they haven't understood the reality of the Israel of God and our citizenship of Israel now. Whether people are from Palestine or Israel or America or Britain or wherever. The key is this. As believers in Jesus Christ, we're together the Israel of God. It's a spiritual Israel we need to understand. My friends, we have to switch on to an, a spiritual understanding of the New Testament. Otherwise, the world and the news and the lies will be dictating and shaping the way we think. I'm calling you today to really engage with this Bible and engage with your citizenship, with your election as a citizen of the kingdom of God. God has plans and purposes for you. The scriptures go on and show us that we're ambassadors. So we live in a kingdom. 
we are ambassadors. We have been elected to that position and God is calling us now to works for that kingdom in our elected role and position. Well, what work are you called to, my friend? What's he calling you to do? In your local church? Yes, get involved. Be busy about the things of the kingdom. Listen, we believe in a priesthood of all believers. Be busy about the things of God. Busy helping your local church. Ask them for what help they need or a ministry. Get in touch with us. Say, look, I want to be involved. I want to be part of this. I recognize now I'm, I'm in this brilliant position of being an elected member of the body of Jesus Christ. And I must serve as an elected member. I mustn't be a lazy member. No, I must be a busy working member of the body of Christ. My friends, if that's you, I invite you now to respond straight away. Write in and tell us and share. It could be the start of something tremendous, you know. We've seen it sometimes. An email comes in and I look back at emails from years ago when I see now people doing great exploits in the kingdom. But they responded to the word of God. So you respond today and God bless you as you do.